So our next panel is going to continue with this theme of the rural urban policy agenda and how we bridge that. We have Julie Bomar from the Wisconsin Farmers Union, Shirley Bloomfield, the CEO of Rural Telecom, and Colleen Fisher, the CEO of Council for Affordable and Rural Housing. And they are here to join us to talk about how the urban and rural policy agenda and strategies can intersect. I have to say, I love to be on a panel with all women. So that's an even um, an even more exciting thing to look out and see these strong women here with us. So thank you so much for joining us. And um, we will start with, we'll just go around. And if you want to say anything else about who you are and who you represent, and then uh, start us out with an answer on what do you think is a key issue that both urban and rural America is dealing with and one that we ought to focus on. So let's start with you, Colleen. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy to be part of this summit. It's great. And thank you to uh, Senator Heitkamp and Senator Donnelly for putting the organization together and for you being on the board. So it's, it's really, it's really great. And I'm always happy to talk about affordable housing. Whoever wants to listen, especially rural, it's very important. Our group represents people who build housing um, in rural areas for low and moderate income families. Um, so we're sort of a unique niche within the affordable housing arena. We work a lot with my colleagues in uh, the urban areas, but Rural has its own challenges, as we all know from being on this, um, being a part of this summit. Um, so I look forward to the to the presentations. So affordable housing, definitely. Shirley, um, want anything you want to say, and then what you see as an issue that we're dealing with across both communities. Sure. First of all, this is a treat to be with all of you. I have long been probably um, Senator Heitkamp's biggest cheerleader. I, I think she's amazing. And look at any reason to figure out ways we can bridge this country more constructively. So NTCA, the Rural Broadband Association, we represent about 850 community-based broadband providers across rural America. So my company spread about 35% of the land mass, but only about 7% of the population base, which again shows um, you know, the, the, the disconnect we sometimes seen between big cities and rural areas and just that handicap of, of, of distance. Um, distance is out there and it makes a big difference. My carriers, because they're community based, are um, extremely aggressive about bringing broadband to the consumers that they serve. Um, because they have to, because that is the bridge that connects a lot of these rural communities to the rest of the world. In terms of things that I think are key issues um, for both urban and in rural America, access to connectivity. We talk about it in rural America because it's a geographic issue. It's a cost issue. We talk about it in urban America because it's a pricing issue. It's an affordability issue. Um, so I, I think, again, one of the things we, we need to focus on is how do we really create this digital economy? How do we make sure we have digital inclusion and bring everybody to the table? I also think, you know, we're facing it, everybody's facing it, workforce. How do we get that next gen workforce? There are some great jobs in the broadband industry, communications industry, 5G. Um, how do we get both those um, young people in urban and rural America interested and engaged and trained and make sure that we've got sufficient workforce? And, and the other one I will throw out there simply because it is wildly top of mind these days is healthcare. Um, access to healthcare for both rural Americans and urban Americans is really top of mind for us. And uh, we're doing a lot of work trying to figure out how we can continue to do vaccine education in these rural communities and tie what is happening into urban America um, together and kind of get that support. So again, looking forward to the conversation. Great. Thank you so much, Shirley. You brought up a couple, but broadband is what you focus most on. And that's um, important that you also bring up some really other important issues, workforce and um, health care. So we have lots of good things we're putting on the table to start. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, Julie. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm beaming in today from Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. I'm super glad to be um, in this conversation. I represent Wisconsin Farmers Union, which is the second biggest agricultural organization in the state of Wisconsin. 
and we're nonpartisan, but we're very progressive leaning and we're born out of the first and the second wave of progressivism in the United States. So it's a little bit more like New Deal progressivism than maybe some of the progressive you know, policies that we might see represented today, but we're, we've always been an organization around social justice and economic democracy. And I see a ton of commonalities between rural and urban issues. And we're really trying hard here in the state of Wisconsin to unite on a common front around some of these issues. So two that we have uh, focused on most recently with urban organizations in Milwaukee um, are actually around water issues, water quality issues, and health care. And um, we can find a lot of common ground, despite all those uh, enemies out there that want to divide us on this issue, um, there is actually a lot more commonality. And I think this is probably true across rural and urban America. If we just can pull together uh, workers and farmers and uh, consumers, I think we could be, again, an incredibly powerful force on the ground. So Julie, I'm going to stick with you with this question, and then I'm going to ask the same for Shirley and Colleen. So I think we we hear a lot, we should bring people together on an issue that they can agree agree on. We hear that. What? Give us a concrete example. What? How do we do that? How does that start? What does that look like? So you've told us that you are doing that in Wisconsin, but tell us how you start that in the work that you're doing. I can give you a couple concrete examples. Um, we, with this last year, we launched a farmer labor solidarity podcast. And you all may know farmers and laborers came together uh, in a major way to enact the New Deal. Um, they stood up together in strikes. They they dumped milk. I mean, they they did things that helped promote um, economic democracy and better better overall democracy in the United States. And so what we did is in COVID, um, we launched this podcast that focused on workers' rights, at, uh, at especially essential workers and meat processing plants and people in that were working front lines, as well as the importance really of having farmers get a fair price and being treated fairly in the marketplace. And there's uh, all along the food chain, you can see people being discriminated against, being exploited, and this keeps prices down and it keeps farmers from having a fair, getting any any price in some cases that they can actually live on. And so this is common ground. And so that podcast highlighted both the past and the present issues in the food chain. And then we've done a lot of shared messaging. So for example, uh, Angela Lang from Black Leaders Organizing Communities in Milwaukee and I were on one of those podcasts and we talked together about the issues that we're seeing in our respective communities around mental health and water quality. And whether you're talking nitrates in our wells up here in western Wisconsin, or you're talking about lead in the pipes in Milwaukee, we still can't drink water out of the tap in parts of Wisconsin. And that has been something that we've been able to do almost our entire lives. And that's changed. And so we have to do better. But by if we don't speak together, there are there are forces out there that foment racism and classism. And they do it because it's effective in keeping ordinary people's agendas from being enacted. Julie, I love that you're giving us an example of concrete conversations for other people to hear across differences um, and that you are showing publicly what it looks like to have those conversations. Thank you. Shirley, what would you say in your work that you have all these uh, broadband providers in rural um, parts of our country, what would you say how What's a concrete way you're trying to bring people together across this div divide? Put, you know, I'll put that in quotes that, that we see. So one of the things that we try to paint the picture of, it's just very similar to when telephone service first spread across the country, is the more people you have connected to the network, the more valuable that network is. So it's getting people in urban America to realize that it is critically important for urban for rural Americans to also have access to that connectivity. It's access to markets for resources and access for energy and, and food resources. And the more powerful that connection is, and the more people connected, the better it is for the entire American economy. So a couple of the things that we've done um, to try to get people to see that 
rural America is not as homogenous as people like to paint it into the corner as being. Um, we've done a couple of things. We, we start an initiative that we call the Smart Rural Community Initiative. And with that, we really talk and work with communities and their leaders to talk about how broadband is the brains behind the community. And what we do is we take best lessons learned from urban America to bring into these, you know, what, what can we be doing in healthcare using broadband? What can we be doing in smart ag or manufacturing or public safety? And frankly, we actually take a lot of those lessons that come from rural America, because in a lot of ways, smaller entities, rural communities, or folks are used to kind of banding together actually have been more innovative in some of the space, again, because they have to. I think of the applications in telemedicine, a lot of this really originated in these rural communities because your, your closest teaching hospital might be three or four hour drive away. So taking those lessons and sharing them. One other thing that we've done um, that we in, in part of that education process is every year our Foundation for Rural Service takes a large group of Capitol Hill staff people out to rural America, take them out there for three days, show them what it's like, put them in the field. And, you know, there hasn't been a trip that we have done. This summer was Montana, where those staffers who think that Leesburg, Virginia is rural, get off that plane and they get it. They've lost cell service somewhere along the way in that bus. They start to become more empathetic. Um, we've literally had Hill staff people who've said, I, I don't need to worry about access to food because I milk comes from the store and you have to go like, okay, no, milk does not come from the store originally. Let me walk you through the process. So, so we're finding that getting people together and, and sharing those stories um, has, been, has been critically, critically important for us to do. I love that. Bring the people out of their comfort zone to, to learn and see. Um, all right, Colleen. So in affordable housing, how have you tried to work together to, to bring people from the divide to understand your issue? So uh, I think one of the things that uh, the, the group that is part of the association that I work with, um, one of the things that we did um, was and it, it's it's really heartwarming for the organization and for the people that have participated. Um, we have a separate 501c3 scholarship foundation, and the foundation provides scholarships to residents of our member properties. And many of the kids, we've got now six scholarships that are. $1,500 a semester, $3,000 a year for four years. And the kids apply from all across the country. Many of them have never gone. They are the first person in their you know, family to have gone to college. Um, and one of the things sort of bridging the, the broadband issue that, Shirley, you've raised is that we had one student who... Um, uh, was a 2016 recipient who um, really wanted to become uh, a nurse. First, for, she was a product of her, lived with her mother. Um, and um, she was just really smart girl. Um, and uh, during the past year, she had three jobs, um, going to school, um, had to move in with her mother because of COVID. And her mother lost her job. She lost two of her three jobs and the broadband connection in her apartment complex um, was so bad that she had to go sit in the parking lot of one of the businesses that had Wi-Fi or one of the fast food places. And so I tell that story because of the fact that she said to us, you know, the one thing that she wanted to do when she got the scholarship is she wanted to move away from rural America. Well, the challenge that she's faced, she wants to stay there and she wants to work in a rural hospital because she wants to help people. And so, you know, it's interesting on the housing side, it is so much interaction with the residents and the management companies and the owners. And it's so much more of a people sometimes uh, business that, that you find uh, that people sometimes forget about that. Um, so we are, you know, we're an interesting facet when you start talking about rural development 
in rural America and rural infrastructure, the housing component of it. Thank you, Colleen. And Colleen brings up a question uh, that we had. And if there's anyone um, that's listening that wants to ask a question to the panel, please use the Q&A function. And we would love to hear questions from people listening as well. But Colleen referenced um, the increased with COVID on the need for rural broadband. And we have seen, I'm an educator by trade and I'm still very connected. And so just the, I mean, literally the fundamental right to education was challenged in our rural communities without having access to broadband. So what, um, Shirley, can you talk a little bit about kind of the challenges and opportunities maybe that have been in, uh, in response to COVID with this big question about rural broadband? So if we haven't learned anything over the course of 20 months, um, shame on us, um, because we certainly learned that how important broadband access was to everybody across this country. We, um, again, because of the networks my guys run, we saw 128% increase in the use of telemedicine. We saw 40% of Americans, regardless of where you were, working from home um, at the height of the pandemic. We also saw at the start of it at least 13.5 million school children completely without access. You know, the stories that break our hearts of kids doing their homework in the Taco Bell parking lot is unacceptable. So um, we've seen a lot. So I, there's a couple of real challenges here. One, really figuring out who has broadband, who doesn't have broadband. It's harder than you would think. Um, again, one of the things the FCC is currently doing right now is they are mapping. They are taking a, 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 a huge endeavor um, right now to actually figure out mapping. Who's got it? What do they have? What are the speeds? Because the other thing I will share that we've learned is that whatever we thought was broadband and sufficient is not sufficient. Um, you know, if you've got two kids doing their online classes and a parent at the VPN at, all at the kitchen counter... 10-1 is not getting you anywhere. 25-3 is not sufficient. So we as a country really need to think about aiming higher and doing better and thinking about broadband as, frankly, a necessity. Um, I think about all those vicious cycles, right? I think about the cycle of, of somebody loses their job, but you can't apply for benefits. You can't apply for a new job unless you've got broadband. Um, we just literally saw Hurricane Ida wiped out a ton of folks down in, in uh, Louisiana. Um, the, the buried fiber that my companies had down there survived the day. Any of the aerial plant um, got wiped out. You know, how do you recover and how do you help people apply for FEMA assistance if you don't have broadband? So that's all to say it is, it is um, more important than ever. The one, if there's a silver lining in what has been a really, really wretched 20 months is that policymakers get it across the aisle. It's not a partisan issue, thankfully. Um, it is an issue that everybody understands it's important to get this solved. So, so we've seen a lot of a momentum, um, a lot of initiatives, certainly a lot of discussion in infrastructure legislation. But on the flip side, I'm also going to share that broadband is not cheap. And in rural communities, particularly those that are served by large nationwide carriers, they're very competitive. And when they are choosing where they're putting their investment dollars, you can bet they're putting it in Chicago or Denver, where they're going to be able to hit 400 customers per mile of infrastructure. That same infrastructure, that same plant with the same costs in rural America averages about five subscribers per mile. And obviously, I've got parts of the country where I've got one consumer per mile in some of those areas. But that doesn't make it any less important to those people. And we as a country need to figure out how we're willing to invest to basically get the job done. And one story I just want to share, because to me, it's kind of the whole story about rural states and rural mentality. But when the pandemic hit um, in North Dakota, all of the, I, I have primarily telephone cooperatives up there. They got together um, and they reached out to the Department of Education and they immediately said, who do you have that you know is a school child who's unconnected. They work together. Three weeks later, 99.8% of all school children in the state of North Dakota were connected to the internet. And I look at that and I think, that's what we can do. If, we, if we're willing to be collaborative, we're willing to share, we're willing to be problem solvers, um, and we recognize how important technology is, you can actually get the job done. 
Well, I wish Senator Heitkamp was on because I feel like she would be cheering uh, to that last uh, statistic about North Dakota. Um, that is great to hear. You know, in North Carolina, we've been equating it to when we got electricity to our whole state. And, you know, it was easy for people to do it in the more urban areas, but we really had co-ops that came in and made the commitment to really service much of our rural parts to get um, electricity. And that was kind of the issue at that turn of the century. And, and it's so parallel in lots of ways here in North Carolina. But, you know, I com come back to my educator lens that the five-year-old in the most rural part of the mountains of North Carolina is no less deserving to accessing their learning than the five-year-old sitting at my house, literally. And, um, you know, us living up to our values means that we hold true to that, even if it's much harder to get it to that five-year-old. Um, so thank you, Shirley, for your comments and um, work and story. Um, Julie, I'm going to start with you on this question, and it's about the impact of increased cost, workforce issues, supply issues. There's, there's a lot of um, COVID-related kind of, we want the economy to keep turning and start even turning more, but we keep getting clogged up with many of those issues. So what are you seeing from your perspective on, on that, how those issues are impacting um, the people you're working with in Wisconsin? Well, I think COVID illustrate. I mean, it really shed light on an, an existing problem um, that, in that, we are seeing increased consolidation in so many different sectors, whether it's agriculture or newspapers or technology, um, and it makes us less secure as a nation because we are dependent on big corporations and big supply chains. And when those crack um, or workers get sick. Um, then we have we don't have the diversity that we need to be able to be nimble and quick and respond and really support ourselves with fuel, food, and finances at the local level, right? Um, and so I think that's what we got a glimpse of that. And um, for for the folks that that I work with, they've been fighting monopolies since it's like our origin story, you know. So so um, so this really just highlighted many things that. Uh, that our members already are experiencing. And it's because they've lost uh, an enormous amount of profit because of uh, the big four, for example, in the beef sector that own, uh, that buy and sell at 85%. I mean, they own that much of the market as buyers and sellers. So they effectively control it all. And therefore um, they can make workers get lower prices. They can put them on at faster speed rates, uh, which are more dangerous. They can send them in without PPP um, and they can tell a farmer that they're going to be a price taker and not a price maker. And then they don't pass that al those savings along to the consumer. And so everybody's getting screwed. You know? And I think this highlighted how dangerous that is when we stopped seeing meat on the shelves. And we started seeing hundreds of thousands of animals, not, you know, being euthanized um, because our supply chains were so fragile. So that's just a couple of things that we've noticed on the ag side of things. Has it felt to you like that's created an opportunity that, you know, everyday folks may, they got their meat at the grocery store, just like Shirley was saying, the milk came from the store and, you know, all of a sudden things that we're used to aren't showing up and how do we use that as an opportunity Julie to to help people understand the the challenges to this consolidation in our economy right well i think it definitely moved the needle in terms of awareness like people had to tune in to where you know their food really was coming from and we did see more demand sometimes at the local level for people buying a share of a hog or a beef or things like that um but this is like david and goliath right i mean this fight is it's, it's wonky. It's hard. People don't understand how complex it is. And, you know, they, and when you talk antitrust, you know, people don't even really have an understanding really of what that is. And so it's difficult to move that needle without having some pretty big political punches coming our way. We were very glad to see the Biden administration talk about enforcement of antitrust. We're glad to see that JBS and other monopolies are getting charged with price fixing 
and with worker endangerment and that kind of thing. It's a start. And we just have to keep pushing at this. Again, it's David and Goliath, but it's terribly important for people across the, um, the political spectrum and at all ends of this food chain. Thank you so much. Um, and Colleen, uh, we see the same supply issues directly impacting a uh, building cost and so, uh, Absolutely. cost, and that is making it even greater challenges to have affordable housing. Um, my husband is actually a builder here in North Carolina, a small builder. Um, and so I see it on a day to day around our kitchen table. So tell us about the impact um, to those challenges in what you're seeing. So, um, you know, one of the, 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 the issues that we are working on, working on very hard with uh, with the House Financial Services Committee, is funding for preservation because the age of the portfolio. Um, it's a it's an older uh, stock uh, because there hasn't been really much new construction brought into to rural America because there hasn't been any money that's been allocated to it. And so when you start dealing with preservation, and it seems that, you know, the housing is about the same age or it gets to the same age in the States and about the same time. So you start doing these preservation transactions and um, they get uh, more expensive um, for the owners or if the, if the property is being transferred. And then, you know, you've got these funding gaps that you need to, to fill because of the fact that when you submitted your application for a tax credit or for bonds, or you got funding for preservation for USDA or home funds or whatever it might be, the combination of, it was one price and now it's gone up substantially. And trying to get, you know, drywall, to get the lumber, uh, to get um, to get the appliances, um, that is a, is obviously a major issue because when you're when you are doing preservation, you also are doing capital improvements and you're doing upgrades to properties that you know were built how many years ago, 30, 40 years ago, and things obviously in construction have changed. And um, you know, appliances are obviously much more energy efficient than what they were before. But where all of those appliances and to get those parts. And so that has been really an issue that has not adequately been addressed because there are so many moving parts to that. Um, and we, you know, certainly hope that uh, that some of the pricing may begin to start to come down. I've heard through some of our developers who are, are doing some um, some of the preservation transactions that some of the lumber pricing is starting to come down um, because there is more supply than there had been or because it's now getting to be the fall. Because, you know, the spring is when, you know, spring and summer is when you start doing um, a lot of the, um, a lot of the renovations. Interesting. I learned, I'm always fascinated with the real estate industry because I feel like I learn something every day, which is why I love to come to work. Um, but when the gas, when the when the refinery plants were shut down, I forget which uh, storm it was in Texas. Um, there's a component of paint that you that is used. So if you had like a white paint that you had and you wanted to, you know, use the same color because of the refineries being cut, you couldn't. The paint paint products couldn't be made. So you had the Sherman Williams of the world. You had all of the, the, you know, the paints that you get at Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever. They were in back supply. Who would have thought? Who would have thought from the refineries that that's a major portion of paint? Yeah. Anyway, it's interesting. I think there have been several instances like that for me where um, you realize for me, it was we needed a new car, which has been a nightmare in this time. Right. But it really all boiled down to we, one plant made the microchips for the kind of car we were looking at that had a fire. And that took out, you know, millions of cars from production. And it goes back to kind of Julie's point. But there's all these instances all of a sudden where we're realizing how... Um, 
interrelated our supply chain is and that right. a little piece here that we don't understand is affecting paint or you know um this microchip is affecting be, mil, having millions of cars available um how interconnected those are but also how consolidated they become it when making them vulnerable to tiny issues that then impact so many other things and then so many of the plants that so many where a lot of these products were made had to close down because there were outbreaks of COVID. So, you know, there were a lot of, I mean, as we say, a lot of interaction, interacting things. If one happened, it, it hit C and went all the way to, to X to Y to Z, whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's a, it, the supply issue is a, is a very big issue. Um, and it's something that, you know, hopefully is going to get resolved, but we'll see. Yeah. I think it's going to certainly take time, it seems, right. um, hopefully little steps as we move along. Shirley, have you seen um, that from the technology world? Supply it is and huge. Yeah. It's huge. And you think about compu you know, components in the tech space, a lot of them originate from Asia. So when Asia was one of the earlier areas of the world that got shut down, um, the production of CPE equipment, your your home router, your fiber optics, um, all of those things tend to have a mass production overseas. You know, a lot of our suppliers have been doing things like airlifting um, because of um, the inability to get the ships into port. Um, my, my providers now, um, frankly, fiber optics has become the new toilet paper. My guys are stocking a year's worth of fiber in their warehouses, God knows where, but um, because they've got builds to do, they've got deadlines to meet for from CARES Act money, from American Recovery Act money, from Reconnect, um, all of these government programs, and they, they can't get the supplies. So we literally have stepped in as an organization and we're we're kind of like the barter control. I literally will have a general manager who reached out the other day and said, I need 200 pedestals in the field to complete this, this fiber bill to this unserved community. Can you help me find them? And we're literally kind of going out there saying, hey, anybody got 200 extra pedestals sitting around and trying to connect the dots for them because there's so much pressure. And the other thing that um, also kind of exacerbates it is, and it's a great initiative, um, you know, the whole Buy American, and I and we support it and I get it, but there frankly aren't enough American manufacturers that are producing this quickly enough to make up for the gap of what um, these components are overseas. The other thing I've learned is that who knew that things actually fall off these international barges? I did not know that's a big deal. It is a big deal. And they fall off apparently all the time. Um, so that ha that has also put some additional pressure on. But then to Colleen's point, the other thing that we are finding is as my broadband providers are growing, because even people who thought they didn't need broadband before now realize they actually need broadband and not just broadband, they need robust broadband. So my, my guys have actually been growing um, and extending into neighboring communities, but they can't house the staff they need. There's not enough available housing in these rural communities. So they're basically saying, we're growing, we're connecting more people. I've got nowhere to put them. Um, so, you know, these issues to the point of the issues just compound one another. Um, you know, we're seeing that cycle right now and, and we've got to figure out a way to break it um, so that we can continue to move forward. So, um, Shirley, Luis has a question for you. Are larger national telecommunication companies pushing into the rural business? Are they more collaborative or antagonistic to your work? Um, in your rural broadband? So this is where I get very diplomatic and delicate. Um, <laughs> so We're all I, familiar with needing to answer that way. So, so this is where I see, and I've had the opportunity to work for two nationwide um, communication providers. So I've had the ability to see inside. Um, it is such a world of difference from a community-based provider who literally are serving the people that you live in and your kids go to school there and, you know, your mom's getting her heart monitored at the local clinic and all of those things. From a large company perspective, um, rural markets are, are, are not very profitable, to be very frank. And when I worked for one of them, I had said, gee, it doesn't seem to me that we are serving these rural communities um, as aggressively as we could be, but I know some small companies who might be interested in buying these rural properties. The response I got from the, from the CEO was, 
no, nah, you know what? We're not interested because there's no competition in these markets. We don't need to upgrade. And they're simply cash cows for us. And it kind of broke my heart that that was the mentality. So I will say, you know what? They trade on Wall Street. They've got a business to run. They actually have to answer to shareholders. I absolutely get it. The trend we have seen with the large nationwide carriers, um, to their credit, has been to actually shed their rural properties. So I looked at things like Verizon about 12 years ago, sold in 20 states to Frontier to basically say, look, we are never going to bring Fios out to these communities. We are simply going to sell them. To their credit, Verizon was extremely clear about their mission, and I applaud them for that. Um, we just saw Lumen, who'd been CenturyLink, just shed um, properties in about 15 states in their rural communities. Same kind of thought. We're never going to get to provide, we're never going to make the investment that we need to for those people. So we're going to roll it into, into another venture. And hopefully that venture that will be a little bit smaller can take care of it. That remains to be seen, but you have a really different set of motivations. But the, but the other thing I will share on that front is everybody gets very excited about competition and they think, well, if only there were more competitors in this market, you know, we might have better services. And, and I would say competition, there's a reason telephone companies years ago were a monopoly in, in because it's expensive. And what we find when we do see competition in some of these rural markets we actually see everybody fighting for that nugget, fighting for that small town and that whole donut ring, which is where, you know, the rural, the farmers, um, you know, a lot of those lower density areas are, they get completely left behind. So I would rather see some of the emphasis in that area be put on how do we incentivize more partnerships? How do we get electric hubs working with telephone companies? How do we get, or telephone hubs, how do we get municipalities to work with local broadband providers? How do you get more community players to the table to say, look, let's bring in the right expertise, um, but let's figure out a way to get the job done ourselves. I think that's more effective than frankly waiting for a large nationwide carrier to solve a rural problem. Great. I love that you talked about it and talked about the strengths and challenges with some of the solutions that people offer, um, like competition and that that works in some cases, but it also means some people don't get that attention. So um, thank you. So this question I'm going to ask to everyone, but I'm going to start with Julie. Um, and it is as the demographics are changing in rural America, um, we in North Carolina have had a major shift in this most recent census data and just less and less people living in rural America. Uh, tell us a little bit about those demographics, that the way that you see them, and has that brought up new issues for rural America or highlighted new things that, you know, hasn't been traditionally in the past? So what demographic shifts do you see in your work in rural America or rural Wisconsin, the states that you're in? And, um, what is the impact of that if there are new things that that has brought up for those of us trying to do what's right for people in rural parts of our country? Sure. Well, with um, kind of the economic decline of rural America, I think across the nation, we've seen young people leave rural communities in droves, right? And they're encouraged often from birth. Like if you're going to make anything of yourself, you got to get out of here, kid. And that's really sad because a lot of kids don't want to go and a lot of parents don't want them to go. And we need leaders. We need those communities to thrive. So having people stay in their community to be engaged in it and contributing to it is, is really important. And they're leaving because the wages just aren't there. And there's also kind of a lack of respect of rural America, like we talked about, you know, uh, in the previous panel discussion, uh, whereby uh, we're not highlighting some of the amazing things about rural areas. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a, it's a brain drain, it's a youth drain, it's a leadership drain that's occurring. Meanwhile, we're seeing the graying of rural America, whereby what's left in many of our rural communities are, are elderly folks who, you know, are, it's called like the graying of America. There's a lot of demographic research written about it. And that means increased health care, increased caretaking responsibilities and things like that, that many of those communities are not prepared for. And we're also seeing the diversification of rural America. Uh, rural America is not white. I mean, it's uh, in many of the rural communities that we do deep canvassing in, 
those little communities wouldn't even be existing if it wasn't for immigrants in the communities. I mean, they are the lifeblood of those communities. So we recently have done some deep canvassing work in Arcadia, and we were bilingual canvassing, deep canvassing, talking to people about what issues matter to them. And that we that was um, we had that that was dual um, Spanish and English. And then we also did deep canvassing in Barron, Wisconsin, in Somali and English. And, you know, there, even though there's animosity between neighbors and sometimes explicit racism, right? Let's just, this is part of what this, all we're talking about urban rule, it's implicit racism is throughout it. But even when people will express I'm coveted, uh, coveted or, you know, just outright racism, um, they still talk about the importance of all Americans, all of our neighbors being able to make it being able to prosper. And so there's still, I hope, some common values around um, work and contribute on contributions and, and being good to one's neighbor that I think progressives can still really capture. Um, so those are some of the things that we're seeing um, go on right now. And it's calling for immigration reform. It's calling for different kinds of healthcare reform um, like never before. Okay. So Colleen, what would you say about the demographic shifts that you see and the impact on the needs for, for rural America from your perspective? So I have maybe a little bit different perspective than, than Julie. Um, and and I, I think one thing that I have learned because of our membership being nationwide, um, and I go to some very small little towns for their state association meetings and whatever, um, that there is not a one size fits all. It's just like urban America. There's not a one size that fits all. Um, in certain areas, in certain rural towns, populations are decreasing. And in fact, rural development, when they look at a housing um, a complex and they see that there's an 80% vacancy rate, you know, do they try to keep that complex within the portfolio or is it time to basically say, you know what? it's time to let this thing, you know, either, you know, somebody come in and buy it and do something else with it, or, you know, we need to do some workout issues. Um, but then there are other areas of the country that there are waiting lists um, that you've, you know, people have been on waiting list for, you know, over a year because there's not enough housing. Um, so it's not a one size fits all. It just depends upon the part of the country where, where you're in. And I think that's probably one of the things that, you know, when you even talk with my members, it's like somebody who is in Florida is not having the same issue that somebody who is in Washington state um, or somebody who's in Oregon, who's dealing with fires and, and, you know, the whole problem out there with, with the fires, which have been just devastating to California and Oregon, certainly it's hard to identify with the hurricanes that, you know, come through the city. South Carolina and North Carolina. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's like, I think people, you need, everyone needs to look at, you know, at their own, at their own community and their state um, and try to figure out, you know, how, how the demographics fit and then looking at programs that can fit within that community or that state. Um, and I think that's one of the problems that sometimes we get into that policymakers forget that, as I said, you know, what happens in California isn't necessarily a fit for North Carolina. Yeah, so you're adding on to Julie talking about the graying and diversifying that that looks different in the different areas. Right. Right. Even in North Carolina, we have rural Western North Carolina and rural right. Eastern North Carolina, which right. have really different needs. Right, yeah. right. And you have a grain, you have a grain North Carolina where you have people who live in my member properties who are on fixed income, who are seniors, who have no desire to move from the community because, oh my gosh, they, they're, you know, grandfather and mother and, you know, my sister and my uncle Billy and ever they've lived there for years. And then you have people, you know, moving out because they just don't have a job or you have people coming in because of COVID and the ability to be able to work remotely in different areas. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So Shirley, what would you say you've seen about if you want to add anything to what's been said about the demographic shifts and what that has meant 
for needs um, from the communities that you're working in. So I'm going to take Colleen's last comment about remote work and say we have a moment in time where I think um, if we can talk enough about where robust broadband exists and we can continue to move forward on the national front with some of these initiatives, we have an amazing opportunity, I think, to really be on the cusp of a rural renaissance of source. Um, we all know the great things about rural America, right? People are great neighbors and there's that sense of collaboration and that innovative spirit because you can, you figure out your own problems and, and you get together and you solve them. Um, you know, the, the close to nature, natural resources. I mean, there's so many things that I think um, rural America has been typecast as and one of the things we have seen um, has been that opportunity as people have moved back, whether it's moving back with mom and dad or basically just finding a lower cost area to live in during the pandemic. But if you can connect to your office in real time and as more and more offices go hybrid or they go remote, the ability to live in a lower cost area without the schlep with traffic can be wildly appealing, but you've got to be able to offer the services. And that is one of the things that we think broadband is a key component. You know, your ability to access telemedicine, um, your your ability to, to, to stream whatever you want to stream um, is really important. And I'll just share this quick story that we had had one of our co-ops in Kentucky profiled by the New Yorker magazine. It's an area that has the hills and hollers that are so steep that, that actually for years they used a mule to take their fiber up the hills and into the hollers because they couldn't actually get tractors out there. But they offer fiber to every one of their customers and they have gig service out there. They have one stoplight. So the New Yorker reporter actually um, had done the story, went out, looked at it, took pictures. And the general manager called me about seven or eight months ago. He said, I was in the post office and ran into this young couple that were literally like, hey, can you point us to the direction of the broadband company? We just moved here from New York City with our two kids because we don't have to go to the office anymore. And we, we read the story in the New Yorker about how there's fiber to the home here in, you know, McGee, Kentucky. And uh, he, he proudly led them the way past the one stoplight into the uh, broadband office. But those are the things I think we've got this opportunity. I think there's a little bit of a moment in time. I feel like the window is closing, but I still think there's an opportunity to really change some of the demographics of rural America. Yes. So um, I wanted to follow up on uh, Julie's comment, because one of the things that we talked about in the panel before this was the need to show up, listen with respect in a non-judging way. And Julie, you referenced deep canvassing. Can you tell us a little bit more of what that entails and what you hope the people you're listening to feel from the approach that you're taking with deep canvassing? Sure. Thanks for um, bringing that up. Yeah, we've been working with rural organizers across the country and deep canvassing is just this one technique um, that uh, folks are employing that really is just about authentic listening and asking questions and holding back an agenda, holding back issues that are important to you and just asking what's important and identifying self-interest and letting people tell their stories. And what we found is because we are a nonpartisan group, um, we're able to get in the door a little bit and people want, want to, are okay with talking to us. And we also are using organizers from the community um, rather than having, you know, people come in from the outside right before the election <laughs> to try to get people, you know, to, to go to the polls. Um, and we're finding a lot of really great information out. Um, I think, you know, people are, are really struggling. That's the first thing. And they also, many of them have identified enemies and they are listening to very different news sources. And so if there isn't a progressive voice out there that is talking about common values, there's one kind of source of information. The radios are dominated, the newspapers are dominated, Facebook is dominated by very, very tight algorithms that are feeding rural America. And we really have to get back going door to door and holding meetings and investing money in long-term organizing and really working with boots on the ground um, to do that work and not either flying over 
or just coming in right before the election, hoping that people are going to turn their minds towards your candidate. Um, so that's what we're learning. Um, and, and also, I just would like to say, I, I have seen some upswing in attention, just like we're talking about today on rule, uh, on the rural United States. And I'm just thankful for that. And I hope that that continues. And it's not just a thought in passing. So give us, um, if you will, a question that you use um, when you're going door to door that has proven it particularly insightful that we can try. What keeps you up at night? And if once you've talked that through, who do you blame for that? Mm -hmm. So that what keeps you up at night question really goes to the core of what we're we're scared or worried about. Um, and then I'm sure or who you blame helps understand motivations um, for how people then respond to that. Um, so I, I love that, you know, taking the time to listen without automatically going into an agenda um, is, is hard, it, especially those of us who, who have things we want to get done, right? Um, so forcing ourselves into structures that do that. Thank you for sharing about your deep canvassing. Colleen, do you have anything to add about how you think intentional learning conversations that are respectful uh, to people might sound um, or or what you would encourage for people wanting to have those types of conversation? So, you know, again, I, I go back to the fact of, you know, our segment is so people oriented uh, because if you don't have a good place to live, you know, you're not going to be happy with your job. You're going to have, there could be health issues. There's a whole bunch of things that housing is so important. Um, it's so important in everyone's life. I mean, all of us here on this panel, if we don't have a nice place, if we don't have a nice bed to sleep in at night, you know, we don't function. And um, one of the things that, that has been difficult for our segment of the industry has been the fact that housing costs money. And you, just like broadband, it's expensive. Housing is expensive, and if you leave things age too long, it gets more expensive, and you have more things that start to happen. Um, but, you know, our residents deserve a, a, a good place, a nice place, an affordable place to live. Um, and our owners are committed, and our management companies are committed to do that. Um, and the people that invest in housing are committed to do it. I mean, it's a niche within, you know, the real estate industry. Um, not everyone, there's been so much discussion over the last six months, 12 months about eviction moratoriums. You know, that's really the last thing that any of my members are even interested in. They want to make sure that the residents who are living in that housing um, stay there, that they've got a nice, as I said, keep saying, a, a, a affordable, decent place to live. Um, and I just think sometimes the conversation gets really overheated um, and people need to sit back and you know say um, when they drive by one of our member properties and they say oh that's for low-income people I didn't think those were I didn't think they looked like that you know it's like perception in people's minds it's very interesting um, and in fact I forget which of the two of you said something about um, housing in Leesburg. Believe it or not, there is affordable rural housing in Middleburg, Virginia, which happens to be the worst country of, you know, Virginia. It's a very expensive area. And we've taken staff people out um, to look at the housing. And, and it's, it's a real eye education for people. Um, and so, you know, as I said, go back to say that, you know, our segment is really, the, you know, the people on people um, segment of, of the of the community. And what I hear from you too is trying to understand their perception, right? Because we right. know that whatever their perception is is their own version of their reality, and so um, trying to listen to understand what that is. Shirley, would you add anything about how conversations that we have door to door, or you know, helping people? as we're just out helping people and meeting people in communities, any recommendations you would have for those conversations? So I would just add, you know, to stay factual. I think we've gotten all so emotional and so tribal 
that um, we find that it's just easiest to stick to facts. And, you know, for example, I look at the fact we run a healthcare program. So we provide healthcare benefits to like 70,000 rural Americans. And we've been pushing pretty hard on the vaccine front because I have the ability to use that platform to say, it costs our healthcare program 32,000 on average for every COVID case we have. And rural American healthcare is even more expensive because we have to airlift some of you out of, out of your communities. So again, I, I just find taking the emotion out, staying factual, um, allows us to have those platforms to have those common sense discussions. Yes, and as a counter kind of to, to so much of what's happening, if we can just stay fact-based. Thank you so much. All right, so we ended the last panel. I'm going to end it this way with you all. Um, in your work that you are doing every day, what makes you hopeful about the future for the rural communities that you serve? Does anyone have an answer on the top they want to start with? Start us off? I'll, I'll just I'll just go ahead and get mine out of the way. So, um you know, obviously, you know, we're all about broadband all the time, but but a program that makes me hopeful, kind of similar to your last panel, that I just, just warms my heart. There is a young group of young people who have come together called uh, Lead for America and organized by a bunch of young people just out of college. And what they are doing is they're really grooming a group of um, people to go back to their rural communities to take on different tasks. Um you know, whether it's broadband deployment, whether it's diversity education, whether it is economic development. Um, and I look at that group and I, I, I've met with them a few times and I, I, I go back to that same thing. Um, you know, if we can continue to get those young people seeing that you can go back to, you know, yes, to Julie's point, you know, it's like, go, go on, leave, go off to school, but come back and, and show us a better way. Um, I look at programs like that and it gives me great hope. And again, I continue to think that rural America has a really fright, you know, bright future if we can continue to bring the same services to rural America that those who live in urban America can enjoy. Thank you, Shirley. Colleen, what gives you hope? That um, Congress, that some of the members in Congress prevail and we, affordable housing gets a lot of money, a historic, a lot of money for, um, for, for housing, both in the urban side, but particularly in the, in the rural side. Um, and I have to give a shout out to Chairwoman Waters um, and her staff because, I mean, she's not from a rural part of the United States. Um, and she is, you know, Los Angeles, she understands the issues um, and she's really fought for for the funding. And I just hope that, as I keep saying, real estate and housing cost money. And, you know, the members need to understand that uh, and that there has to be a commitment. Um, because it's a it's a it's a vital it's a vital part of rural communities, um, the housing and the need to preserve it, and the need for new construction too. So there's an opportunity now um, to there's to an opportunity for affordable housing. So that's yeah. definitely hope for for many of yeah. us. All right, we hope so. Julie, you're our our last uplifting hope here. Yes, I'm just going to go back to that deep canvassing and a question that we ask at the very end after we've had a conversation and we, we've introduced ourselves. And the last thing that we say is the Wisconsin Farmers Union is fighting for rural communities to be places where all working people can have a chance to live comfortably, raise a family and be supported. No matter what you look like or the color of your skin or where you're from, most of us want the same things. But corporate bosses and political insiders have rigged the rules of our economy to grab wealth and political power for themselves. And then they blame people of color, or immigrants, or poor people trying to divide us and distract us from what we have in common. Do you agree? Over 90%, actually even higher in some many communities, agree with that in rural communities. So that gives me hope that they may not like the messenger, the progressive messengers all the time and who they think of as progressive, but they agree with progressive values. And that gives me a lot of hope. Uh, well, I love ending that way because I think um, in all the work we do, we have to hold on to the hope that we can make progress on these critical issues like supporting farmers, um, certainly affordable housing, broadband, all of these are 
interwoven issues to how we improve outcomes for people across our country, but particularly in the rural areas.